And so with a bit of luck, you've just um, watched the opening titles to a series of uh, documentaries that was broadcast by the BBC in 1993 that was called Storm from the East, and it dealt with the subject of the Mongols. Um, now, now I've, I've had my passion for the Mongols reignited by um, Nigel at Darkling of Eldridge, who has uh, just uploaded a video on the subject of his uh, um, 15mm figures that he's started to paint, his, his new project. And um, I just wanted to do a kind of uh, response to his video and a kind of a uh, little bit of a, a ramble on my own um, passion for the for the Mongols because they are they are a superb um, army to collect and and war game with um, as as Nigel is um, already. Uh, demonstrating and I just wanted to kind of reinforce his message really but my army um, as you'll see when I, I show you it in close-up um, is uh, not of the same quality by at all and um, in 28 mil rather than 15 but um, I collected and painted these figures um, many years ago uh, around the time of the, uh, the 1993 um, documentary on on the BBC, and um, I've still got to paint, as is my want. I I've purchased lots of figures when I buy armies, and uh, never get around to painting a tenth of them. So I've got probably five times the amount of figures that painted as unpainted. Um, sorry, the other way around. I've got five times as many unpainted as painted. Um, so really, just a, a short ramble on, on Mongols then. Um, I, I think they just stimulate so, so much in the way of um, creativity in terms of, of um, how you can play with them, what armies you can put together, how you can paint them. And, and it also, it's just such a wonderful story. Um, it, it reminds me really of my um, obsession with complexity theory, really, that, that um, the Mongols um, just seem to explode out of Mongolia at the beginning of the 13th century and um, their empire, the land empire, it stretched all the way from China and Korea across Central Asia to um, the Middle East and up into uh, the Ukraine and Russia um, and at one point, they had defeated the Polish army and the Hungarian army, and there was nothing. Um, there was nothing between them really, and the Atlantic Ocean. So they could have, they could have pressed on and and um, conquered an empire that stretched all the way from France to China. Um, it was only the, 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 a quirk of fate that um, the Khan at the time, Ogodai, died and the armies withdrew um, from, from Hungary and pulled their armies back into the, um, the area around the Don River um, while they, while they um, went back to um, Mongolia to... Uh, um, elect a new Khan, as it were, um, that stop that stop that uh, final catastrophe. But it does mean that that, that I mean, I, mean I, I think you can hear it in sort of what Nigel was saying already. That you start to you, you you begin with a sort of small army, and immediately the the possibilities of where you can campaign with it just explode. Um, 
it does it does kind of create a little bit of a problem because you'll find that the same kind of process is going on with figure manufacturers that you'll often get um, ranges of figures and I might talk about this a little bit more when I show you the figures in more detail but you'll get ranges of figures that um, include uh, a wide disparity of troop types that, don't, that c you can't realistically put together or authentically put together to constitute an army. Um, classic example of that is um, Old Glory who have a have a, um, a range of Mongols that they actually title Mongols in Europe and yet within their, their packets of figures they include Korean auxiliaries and Chinese archers and lots of lots of figures who I just simply don't believe um, would have appeared um, on the plains of Hungary or, or outside Krakow in Poland, um, which the, the title of their range implies they are intended for. Um, but you find that in other ranges as well. I might, I might sort of talk about that a little bit more um, when I show you these figures in, in a little bit more close up. Um, but that, that really is the, the temptation and the, the fun of, of uh, wargaming with um, Mongols, but it, it can also, as it has done me, with me, it, it can lead you off in too many, down too many avenues so that you don't focus on one particular um, theme of the Mongols. And then, of course, um, the, their, their influence didn't only spread over such a huge distance, but it also lasted for centuries and centuries. So as, as time goes on, you'll find um, that the, Mongol, the Mongols conquer an area, settle in that area, and then alter their, in the nature of their armies and, um, and so on. So that um, it's very it's very period specific as well. Um, so, for instance, um, the Mongols who settled in the in the sort of Middle East in the area that is now Iran and Iraq and so on um, under Hulagu, um, that became known as the Ilkhanate. They ad they adopted the Muslim religion and their dress and so on altered their fighting style, changed to an extent. Um, and then after that, in the same area, you get sort of, you get um, other empires emerging such as Tamerlane and the Timurids. Um, his range of conquests extend even further than um, the original Mongol invasion, so he invades India. Um, th then after that, you get other um, descendants of um, Mongols, um, both, both via Timurid and via Genghis Khan. Um, and from them, you get the emergence of the Mughals, who then go on to uh, invade India themselves from their kind of um, original kind of power base really around Afghanistan um, and they of course then spread into the whole uh, the whole of India or most of India um, and the Mughal dynasty lasts for several centuries as well but by that point um, their dress and their um, weaponry has morphed in, entirely from the original um, Mongol um, armies. In China you get uh, the Yuan dynasty and Kublai Khan who is a descendant of Genghis Khan but again 
um, th there's a sort of dichotomy between um, the Mongol leaders who want to remain more firmly attached to their steppe culture and um, the, the faction that prevailed under Kublai who um, settled down with China as their power base um, so they become far more of an oriental um, character for their armies um, they then go, Kublai then goes on to attempt an invasion of Japan and although his two attempts fail um, that has a, a knock-on influence in in Japan and in the in the whole national identity of Japan, in that they see that they see a divine favour in the fact that um, Kublai's armies are um, repulsed. Um, so there's a knock-on influence all the way from Japan. So you get you get this spread of influences and inf impacts and effects rippling around virtually the entire known world. Um, other other um, uh, influences in places like Vietnam and, and uh, the Indochina um, area, uh, into Tibet, all kinds of places. Um, and it, as I said earlier, it reminds me very much of my um, my passion for complexity theory, that just one, one or two small events in one part of the world, um, Genghis Khan or Tamerlane managing to unite the, the Mongol tribes together, and, that, and then that, that sort of relatively small um, beginning, rippling out and exploding permeating so many different areas and having so many diverse and different effects on different parts of the world that um, last right down to the present day that um, you can still see that uh, Tartar influence in, in Russia today, in places like Iran, um, there is still a... Um, a kind of physical appearance. You can see, you can see sort of physical uh, reflections of of uh, the Tartar um, spread into those parts of the world. Um, you you can still have, t you can still incorporate Tartar armies into um, the Renaissance period, the, the Eastern Renaissance. So. Um, you get Tartars serving as auxiliaries for the Poles and the Lithuanians, um, fighting against Cossacks in the 17th century. Um, just goes, just goes on and on. But as I say, it's very similar to that kind of uh, avalanche effect that you can you can see in complexity theory um, with, with unpredictable consequences and um, small changes happening in one place, large place, large changes happening in another. Um, but anyway, that's, and, and I think I think you can tell from what Nigel is saying um, on his first video that, that he's, he's immediately um, appreciated that enormous um, diversity and of, of Opportunities to go down various avenues and um, pick pick a variety of theatres. Um, I, I think, looking back on it now, my own um, if I were to do it in a more dis if I would put my army together in a more disciplined way, um, or were to take up painting Mongols again, I think I would aim for an army um, such as the one that was. Um, that met the Mamelukes and was defeated by the Mamelukes and the Ein um, and and that's that's partly because I can still use a lot of the sort of the I can still use a lot of these figures, um, but it's also that um, the idea of a Mameluke army appeals to me as well to match them, um, because then you have the opportunity to play those Mamelukes against other armies such as the Crusaders. Um, 
So it gives you, it gives you a kind of whole universe that you can, um, where the arm is a historic, where his, his genuine historical counterparts, and you can you can um, match them all together. Um, but anyway, I'll st stop waffling. I'm going to take the uh, the camera off its stand and then show you the figures in a little bit more detail and talk about talk about various things as I pan the camera around. Right, so there's bound to be a little bit of um, shake on the camera now, so I'm holding it by hand. Um, we'll start off in the centre of the table then, so I've got three command stands. And they come from a variety of ranges. Um, even though um, I can be quite disparaging at times about irregular, I really do think that um, Irregular have the best and most accurate depictions of a Mongol army um, that you can find in 28mm. Um, that's partly because they match my um, notion of what a Mongol army should look like. I mean, I've spoken about this previously on... Uh, a wargaming ramble that I did on YouTube, um, but I really think irregular. Some of the irregular sculpts are really clumsy, really crude, um, but they do have a nice um, representation of of, um, of and a nice variety of figures. So in this centre stand here, three out of these four figures are from irregular. The only one that isn't is the Nakara Drummer, drummer which is a Dixon's figure. And I really dislike Dixon's now, I have decided. Um, but this particular figure, I don't mind. He's one of, he's one of the better um, figures from Dixon's Mongol range. Um, but if you can see in the background there, make a note of that guy holding the... Uh, the eagle or whatever it is, some kind of bird of hunting bird of prey. Um, because this is another reason why I like um, Irregular, is that they have copied um, some illustrations from one of the Osprey books. And um, coincidentally, this is exactly what Nigel was saying about um, his Legio Heroica figures in 15 mil you can see a very obvious influence um, on those 15 mil figures as well from Osprey. And it just, it just sort of helps to resonate a little bit and helps your enthusiasm to grow. If you can see, um, if, you can, if you can see a picture in a book that resembles the figure that you're painting so closely, um, and in Irregulus case, there's quite a lot of those. There's another example, again, I've spoken about this on a previous um, episode, but there's another example there of uh, the Mongol on horseback leading to um, Middle Eastern captives. That's an exact copy of, um, of an Osprey illustration, as I think is that guy there holding the banner. Pretty sure he appears in one, in, the, in the Osprey book that I've got as well. Um, the figure at the front there isn't irregular. He is a Steve Barber figure, and um, this is another reason why I do purchase so many figures when I have the opportunity. Because Steve Barber had a fantastic range of Mongols. Uh, all these heavy cavalry in the next rank there are from his range, and it's not produced anymore. He just seems to have discontinued it. I just simply don't know why. Um, but fortunately, I've still got a lot of those figures um, unpainted, so I'm not going to um, I'm not going to kind of miss the fact that the, the range has disappeared for a long time. Um, on, in terms of the lances, um, the lances come from another range again that again has disappeared, and I can't even remember the name of the figure manufacturer. Um, but I like I like those lances because they are 
more appropriate. They have the hooks on them for dismounting enemy riders and so on. Um, I don't like putting just sort of straight spears into Mongols' hands. Um, and again, that's another reason why, looking back at um, Darkling of Eldridge, his latest video, his, his Legio Heroica figures all have that, that the appropriate lance, which is another reason why I'm impressed by that 15mm range. Um, behind them, a whole mix of light cavalry from a variety of ranges. Oh, sorry, no, the, 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 these ones here are heavy. These ones here are heavy cavalry from Irregular. Um, and they're not as nice as their light infantry. Um, they tend to be a little bit more, I don't know what, I don't know what it is about them, but they're not, they're not quite my idea. They, they don't look like these guys, the Steve Barber guys, which I think are more accurately depicted. The irregular ones look more like a sort of variant, a sort of um, something like the Ilkarnate troops or something like that. Not all of them, but um, that's what they strike me as trying to represent. And then behind that you have a whole load of light cavalry, bases two to a base, and they come from a variety of uh, ranges, mainly... Uh, irregular, and I think I think the irregular light cavalry are really good. Um, I particularly like uh, this type of figure. Um, but mixed in with these, there's a lot of others. There's there's a company called Warrior up in Glasgow who still exists, and those that pair there are from them. They sell very cheap figures in bulk. Um, I've got a lot of their dismounted infantry, which tends to be mainly Korean auxiliaries and so on. Um, so I haven't painted them up. Because as I say, um, I, when I look for foot figures for Mongols, I'm really looking for figures that um, are more appropriate to the campaigns in Europe. Um, so those guys there, they are... As are the two at the back there. And then you're getting back into irregular figures here. Um, there's a whole, a whole variety of ranges here. Um, I think those two there, the drummer and the chap with the lance, are Steve Barber. I think so. I'm not entirely sure. Anyway, let's bring you forward. I'll uh, show you some more figures at the front here. Um, so, um, this figure here is from another range that no longer exists. And again, I've forgotten the name of it. But um, this, is, this is a dummy. Um, so the Mongols were very um, crafty in a lot of their tactics. They often attached... Uh, brushwood to the tails of their ponies they would they would ride one pony and have four in train so they could stay on horseback for long periods of time um, but they also attached brushwood to their tails so that there was a vast amount of dust huge dust clouds um, kicked up which gave, which gave the enemy the impression of a much greater horde than actually existed um, Again, that takes you back to that opening titles of uh, Storm from the East, where they have, it's not intended as a dust cloud, but they have that, that cloud uh, menacingly gathering over the attacking horsemen. Um, but this is a dummy, because they would also put dummies onto their um, unridden ponies in order to increase the pretense of, of size in their army. Because uh, from a distance you can't tell the difference between a scarecrow and a, a genuine rider. Um, these bolt throwers are from Old Glory's Mongol in, in Europe range. Um, so they are a useful uh, 
addition to an army, but um, I, I played this army using fog, and um, they aren't. I wouldn't recommend putting bolt throwers into a fog army. Um, it kind of uh, it sort of counters the kind of mobility that you require from from a Mongol army if you're going to play it um, in an authentic way. There's another dummy there. Another two bolt throwers, so old glory again, and then another dummy there. Um, behind them, you've got a lot of irregular figures here. Um, this is my point about infantry: that um, irregulars, infantry, I think, is all either Korean, which the guys at the front are, and the second row of archers are. So they're Korean auxiliaries, so as I say, I'm, I'm averse to putting them in an army that is uh, um, where the army's campaign is set in Europe. And even more so, the chaps at the back who are Chinese archers, um, they have things like the, uh, the wings on the helmet and so on, and, and all, the, all these figures, the appearance of them, is taken from um, the Mongol invasion sculpt scroll. So the, the, they're, they're depicting Kublai Khan's army that um, attempted the invasion of, of Japan. So this is what I'm saying about how you end up kind of going down too many different avenues when you put your army together. Because um, I don't believe that an army that had the appearance of Kublai Khan's armies that campaigned in China and uh, attempted the invasion of Japan ever appeared on the steps of somewhere like Russia. Uh, which way should we go? Got um, right over here. Um, these figures are based differently. Most of my army is based for on a just sort of DBX standard. These figures I rebased individually. And, and painted the bases with more of a sandy colour because I wanted to use them um, as various troop types in Crescent and Cross, which I have sort of given up on now. Um, I've changed to playing uh, Soldiers of God for the Crusades period. So I've taken them out and I've put them back in my Mongol army box and I'll get round to repainting them at some stage, but they are Steve Barber, definitely, and they represent Cumans. And uh, behind them is another few figures, odds and sods, that I'm not particularly keen on, that I just uh, rebased individually, to, again, to use for Crescent and Cross. So you've got rather a crude, irregular figure on the left, a Dixon model, um, a figure that I kind of... Um, He's got the he's got the body of a an archer from one range and the that's right yeah and it's an irregular horse and I think what happened was that the figure snapped in some way so rather than throw the horse away I took a I took a body off of a, a figure that I didn't think I was ever going to get around to painting and made him a horse archer and a Dixon figure again not a bad Dixon figure but. Um, Nothing special. Um, then, we, then you've got a camp that I put together from various bits and pieces. The, that is all, I think it's all stuff from Irregular. Um, and I really like that. Uh, lots of um, weapon piles. I can't remember that. I think they're Irregular. I wouldn't like to swear to it, but I think they're irregular. I use them as markers and things. Um, a Dixon camel could be used for a lot of variety of, but it does come under their under their Mongol range. But um, you could use that for a variety of things. A couple more figures from irregular guarding. A couple more yurts from irregular. Um, while I'm over this side of the table, I'll just show you these figures. But I really hate these. Um, this is what I mean about Dixons. These are all, these are three of the Dixon Mongols, and I can't, I don't understand why anyone buys Dixon figures. They are so sort of 
lumpy and oh, I don't know. And the horses look ridiculous. I mean, at least they've covered these horses with armour, but I think their horses look more like My Little Pony or something like that. I just don't. I don't understand why anyone um, likes Dixon. I mean, at one time they were the only range the way you could get a, a, a good sort of collection of samurai together. But they've got such a distinct and unrealistic appearance and it just doesn't appeal to me at all. Um, so I painted these up a long, long time ago when I was desperately searching for ranges of figures and I will never, I will never play with them again. Um, but I don't have the heart to throw something I painted away. Um, right, and then over the other side of the table we have um, some more figures from Old Glory. Now these are the kind of foot figures that I like. So these are from the Old Glory Mongols in Europe range. They do do a lot of, as I say, a lot of Koreans and Chinese and so in their, in their range, which I don't think is appropriate. But if you're going to put Mongols on foot then this is what I think they should look like. Um, and I particularly like the drummer. It's sort of a, a little vignette almost. It's two people carrying the drum in, uh, with, on rope with the drummer walking behind them beating the drum and a command figure there as well. Um, so I like these. I think these are good. I'll definitely uh, get more of those. Um, and then right at the back here, finally, there's a whole load. Again, I rebased these for um, Crescent and Cross, I think. Um, but really, these figures, again, I think the range is called BB. This is the range that I got the spears from. Um, no longer available. But to my eye now, I think these these would do for a Chinese kind of army, um, Kublai Khan, Yuan period, I think, especially the, that helmet. But they're all, they're very, it's very old-fashioned kind of wargaming type of figure. All very, you can vary the heads, but uh, the bodies are all identical. So they're very static and uh, um, not particularly kind of keen on them. Um, but I've got them all there. They might come in handy one day. Um, so that's the army. Um, I just want to finally go on to talk a little bit about material, um, visual kind of references and films and books and so on. Um, so I'll just stop the camera again for a second. Okay, so just go through these quickly then. So in terms of DVDs and films, um, this film, Mongol, came out, I don't know, was it 10 years ago or so? Probably a date on here, but I can't see it through the camera. Um, visually, a really attractive film. Um, it has some really, uh, uh, what I think is sort of realistic clothing and scenery and so on. Um, the story is purportedly taken from, um, oh, what's it called, The Secret Life of the Mongols or something. Um, so the storyline is largely um, fictional, but based on a kind of medieval uh, version of events. Um, but, uh, so it doesn't, it doesn't accurately... Um, portray much of the genuine kind of early life of Genghis Khan but it's it's worth watching simply for the um, the visual appeal uh, it is a very good film it sort of it shows the early early part of uh, of uh, Genghis's life but it sort of it has this sort of strange plot where he's um, been imprisoned by um, the Chinese one of the Chinese nations and uh, 
doesn't bear any kind of resemblance to the fact. This is more, this is closer to uh, the story that, I think it was called, the, I think it was called The Secret Life of the Mongols. Or the, or, I can't remember, I should have looked it up before I, um, before I started this ramble. But this is, this is a good film, subtitled, uh, so it's just called Genghis Khan. I mean, of course, a lot of your older generation will remember uh, Omar Sharif starring as Genghis Khan in the 1960 film of that title. Um, totally ridiculous film. Um, this is a good example of... Um, I really like this film. It's called Warriors of the Steppe. And it's a fictitious story, um, but set in Kazakhstan. Um, so this is a later period, I suppose... I don't know, 14th, 15th century. I think, if I remember rightly, there's dynamite in there in, in, in one place where they blow up a, a magazine. But um, it's an example of... Um, I'll try and put up a, a still from this so you can see what I mean. But it has some really good uh, battle scenes and um, it, it gives you a really good sort of taste of uh, Mongol armies fighting and so on. Um, but it's really a, the Kazakhstan, Kazakhstani resistance to a Mongol tribe. Um, on the way of books, I haven't got that much. Uh, I've got this one, Leo de Hartwig's Genghis Khan. I'm just going to stop that noise for a second. Sorry about that, my fridge is very noisy and it always kicks in at the worst possible moment. Um, yeah, so this was written... <laughs> Uh, I think he's Dutch, and it was written in 1979, published in 1979, um, but very, uh, very well written. I've got um, The Devil's Horseman by James Chambers, which is just but solely about the Mongol invasion of Europe, and again, another very good book, and James Chambers was actually um, an advisor on the BBC documentary Storm from the East, um, which if you can get hold of, either on YouTube or uh, wherever, really worth watching Storm from the East. Um, there was an accompanying book, and this is it. Um, some of the illustrations and photographs in here will give you an idea of the, the visual nature of the documentary. I thought it was wonderful, wonderful series. I was watching it again the other night, um, stimulated by um, Darkling Eldridge's video. That's the kind of shots they had, lots of Japanese um, extras, because it was, I think the BBC did it in collaboration with NHK, the Japanese, TV station, and even though the, the Japanese, uh, as I was saying earlier, um, uh, repulsed Kublai Khan's invasion, and um, it, it partly formed their their notions of their own national identity. You do, you there is, you do, you do get a lot of. Um, I mean, all the, I, I bet you that all these extras here are Japanese and not Mongolian um, because you do get a lot of interest in the Mongols in Japan and there is in fact um, a, a genetic uh, link um, there's a sort of some peculiar um, anomalies that the Mongols and the Japanese share um, especially in in their infancy there there is um, there are anomalies at the bottom of their spine and so on um, that shows that the Japanese and the, uh, the Mongols do share some a common genetic origin at some point in their history. Um, but anyway, very worthwhile watching that if you get, if you can get hold of that, or even even finding the book is worth reading. Um, I forgot to bring down. I've got the I've got the same Osprey book. Nigel showed 
Um, I should have had that ready actually because um, again I'll I'll, um, I'll probably scan some of the pages from it and throw those up so that you can s and, I've, and I've already put them up in this video because I'll put them alongside the the figures that I was showing you earlier. Um, but this is another good uh, reference for painting. It's the Mongol warlords. So it deals with Genghis Khan, Kublai Khan, Hulagu, Hula and Tamerlane. Um, and it's by David Nicol with plates by Richard Hook. And there's a lot of lot of black and white photography and illustrations, and also um, lots of good colour plates in here. I mean this is an example here, this is what I was telling you about, about the, you see the wings on the helmet there? Um, this is Marco Polo um, uh, reviewing um, some armies from in, in China. So basically these, this is the Korean appearance of the wicker shield and this is the Chinese appearance um, and you, I just don't believe you would get that in in Europe, um, and in fact, this is yeah that was that was in the section about Kublai Khan. Uh, this is uh, Kublai Khan invading Vietnam. So you can see uh, them coming up against elephants. Uh, that armor there is very similar to the figure that I was showing you. Only different coloration. And that is meant to be, uh, that's, that is Chinese as well, so there you are, I was right about that. Um, nice pictures, uh, it's Kublai Khan, Genghis Khan rather, falling from his horse, that's how he died. friend uh, Jelmy, who I believe uh, they fell out and he killed him eventually later in life. But um, anyway, that, that shows you some of the uh, illustrations from that book. So well worth, well worth finding if you're, if you're going to paint a, a Mongol army. And I also had um, uh, have a lunch. I also had this, which is written by a war gamer, um, Michael Sace. Um, it's typical of the, the sort of literature that you used to be able to buy 20 years ago that's not, not sort of profitable for people to produce now. Um, but as he says, in it's all black and white and just maps and so on. It's about ways of war gaming. Um, Mongol armies and so on. So it's really uh, an extended article that you might find in a magazine nowadays. Um, but he says here it's been now it has been specifically written for the war gamer, um, and as such contains as much information as has been possible to find a number of maps, both as visual aids in tracking the progress of each campaign and suggested war games type terrain. So um, can't even remember where I got it from now. But um, you might find that on a bring and buy somewhere if you're lucky. Anyway, that's the end of uh, that's the end of my long waffle on on the Mongols. So I'm um, really looking forward to uh, seeing more output from uh, from Darkling Eldridge because he's got such a superb style of painting and it it really matches what you need with a Mongol army as well. He's very good at producing kind of suppressed colours and, uh, and showing textures and furs and, and hides and so on and um, uh, representing wear and tear and uh, the sort of dirty grubbiness that you get from a, a, a long campaign. Um, so he's going to do a fantastic job so keep an eye out for his videos. And I can feel I've really got to get out some of my unpainted figures now and get to work on them. Um, it's another kind of itch I now have to scratch again. Um, so in the future I might be putting up updates on uh, fresh figures that I painted. So thanks so much for watching everyone and see you on the next video. Bye for now.